Well, good morning, everyone, and it's good to see you all here um, on the first day of the year, as Brenda mentioned. It's, uh, it's also good to be in the house of the Lord on his Sabbath day. Well, Mary Ann started with a, with a children's story. I've got a, a little story for the adults this morning, too, and it came, comes out of our devotion from a couple of days ago. It's about two boys, about uh, Jan and Yuan. They were uh, little hobos, these two, and uh, what they did one particular day uh, before the Sunday service, they went into the church and took the altar, the, sorry, the Bible off the altar. And what they did with the Bible was actually disgraceful because they actually cut a little bit out of the, out of the book, out of the pages, so they could sit an explosive in there, a little wee um, fireworks. Um, I don't know what it was, but, you know, they were naughty boys. So what they did is then they then placed the, uh, the Bible back uh, on the altar. Fortunately, the priest had actually taken the, taken the Bible and, uh, for his devotional. And as he took the Bible, of course, it, it did explode. And uh, luckily, the priest wasn't hurt through that. However, Jan and, and Johan were thinking that on Sunday morning, at the morning service, that they were going to be told off. But it was interesting to hear how the priest approached it. He says, be careful. As you open God's word, be ready. It is explosive. There is power in God's word. And I thought, wow, that's a wonderful story to start off the service this morning. We're now into, uh, sorry, we are now in a year, a year into the new decade. And it is truly amazing to see actually what has happened uh, amongst us and around us, us throughout the year 2010. You know, and we may look or wait with bated breath or apprehension as to what may unfold in the lives and those around us as we enter into 2011. All, all sorts of thoughts are brought to mind as, we, as to what we may experience through this year in regards to health, work, will I get work, will I have work at the end, our children, their education, uh, ageing parents, the church, the economy, and so it go, goes on. We simply, from the first day on, place all our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 2010 also indicated that the last day events will also affect us here in New Zealand. We are not, uh, we are not protected. We will be affected as every other part of the globe will be and has been. Nature has rebelled through continuous earthquakes in Canterbury and our prayers go out for all those as it still uh, happens down there in Canterbury. Flooding continues to affect many parts of Australia, which normally records highest temperatures at this time of year instead of rainfall measurements. Fires also have caused considerable amount of damage on both sides of the Tasman. Even camping grounds in New Zealand have been affected by flooding and also uh, road closure. Drought was also barking at our own back door until recent rains subdued it. However, our summer is not over yet. And unfortunately, we all have witnessed the tragedy at the Pike River Mine, and it's also ongoing. Our media is constantly reporting tragedy and natural disasters that sometimes we get sick of hearing or reading about. Not because we are not concerned, but because it is thrashed about for days, even weeks. But as the news splashes across our screens and reports come through of, this, of these nature events, natural events, or that catastrophe here, or there are so many injured in this pile-up, that domestic or this drunken argument, family abuse to this child, this and that, and the news goes on. When we see this, what are our thoughts? Where are our thoughts? And how do we react? Do we also brush it off as as another happening in other people's lives, thinking they only have themselves to blame, or, yeah, that was really unfortunate. Even news items that is reported, nine out of ten, someone has been injured, died, or something negative has happened to them or their property. These are also people whom Christ our Lord has died for, and they are hurting, even struggling, to cope. Just because the numbers are multiple, remember everyone 
as a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, etc. The list goes on. Because of one stupid act or natural disaster, so many are affected. Do not let our compassion for others to grow cold. Take the time to pray for those families who have lost loved ones in car accidents or through any form that life has been lost. In the last days, the love for one another will grow cold. If it starts with us, how sad is that? Is the earth going to be? We as Christians should never lose our love for those around us. We are to display love in its truest form as from the hand of God. As we stand on this first day of the year, 2011, we hopefully look forward with enthusiasm, excitement and hope for what this new year might bring. We, the church, have dedicated this year to evangelism. And uh, we trust by God's grace, his spirit and your efforts that many others will be worshipping with us this time next year. Without making a New Year's resolution, how do you want this year to develop in your life on a spiritual level? Let's duplicate 2010 in the way we commenced it. Eight people were baptised in February last year and finished with two people just last month. Plus, we had five professions of faith and many others have transferred into our church. And yes, in two weeks, we will be having another baptism here. So we're going to start off right, aren't we? As we go from one year to another, and not only then, Sister White states, as we go into the future, we should never forget how the Lord has led us in the past. And he has led and blessed throughout 2010. I'd like us just to turn in our Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 20, and reading from verse 21. Uh, sorry, verse 1, uh, 2. Sorry, the print's a bit small here on this one. And it says here, and I'm reading actually also from the NIV to compare it with the, the New King James. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. And it simply says, and this is the Lord's expression, before he actually hands over the Ten Commandments to Moses. Reading from the NIV, it says, I am the Lord you got, your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In the New King James Version, as you, a lot of you have in your hand today, it says, I am the Lord your God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. The land of slavery, house of bondage, both statements reveal the same thought. But because of their number, slavery covered the land in Egypt. For the, Hebrews, for the Hebrews, it was their home. For so long, that is all they knew. They lived in bondage day in and day out. They breathed it. That is what they saw and lived every day. They were saturated with slavery, with bondage. Exodus chapter 13, verse 3, it says, Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out of this place. It's interesting to note, even before they had left Egypt, Moses was instructed to tell the people to remember this day as they celebrated or prepared for the Passover feast. And that night, the Lord delivered them from the hands of slavery. Salvation had been granted to them and that they were no longer serving the Egyptians, they were now free to serve their deliverer. It is interesting to note that the NIV, the New International Version, reading from Genesis 10, 13, it translates, translates the name Misraim, as mentioned in the New King James, as simply Egypt. Misraim is translated as the word Egypt and it says it was the father of the Ludites, the Anamites, the Lebabites, the Naphtuhites, and verse 14, and Pathrusites, the Cashluhites, from whom the Philistines came, and Cathtorites. Interesting to note that these families are the families that initially were that land of Egypt. The exodus from Egypt was not a small, unnoticeable event. Their freedom and deliverance from Egypt was enormous. 
the logistics of moving this many people in their possessions was absolutely amazing. Now, the, in, in, uh, in verse 12, uh, chapter 12 of Exodus, verse 40, it says, Now the length of time that the, Israel, the, the Israelite lived in Egypt was 430 years. 430 years is a long time, isn't it? An incredible length of time. A time when so much can happen, especially as this Hebrew nation lives and breathes amongst the culture of this heathen nation, Egypt. Idol worship was so common. Sexual immorality, worship of the dead were popular sins, and they were exposed to these and much more for 430 years. Their own faith had nearly dissolved from existence. We, as a nation of New Zealand, are only just 250 years old, and look how far the New Zealand people have fallen from God. We have citizens living here in New Zealand who haven't even heard the name of Jesus, and if they have, it's most probably they've heard it through profanity or uh, in vain. In Genesis chapter 46, verse 26, it says, All those who went to Egypt with Jacob, those who were his direct descendants, not counting his son's wives, numbered 66 persons. Chapter tw uh, verse 27, Then were the two sons who had been to, to Joseph in Egypt, the members of Jacob's family which went to Egypt were 70 in all. Don't forget um, Joseph's wives. These are his, Jacob's descendants, and of course there would have been other families that came to Egypt during the famine. The word of God then mentions how many left. In uh, Exodus 12, verse 37, it says, The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. What a phenomenal amount of people. 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. These are the, the children of the descendants of Jacob during those 430 years of captivity in Egypt. And when you think, it would have, it would have taken them days, even weeks, let alone to get them all th uh, through the Red Sea, such a, a mass of people. This was just not a very small event. This was huge. And it was just as historical for the Egyptians as it was for the Hebrew nation. Logistically a nightmare, but the God of heaven is in control. You know, the word Egypt appears 566 times in the word of God. In the book of Leviticus, it appears 11 times. And out... Eight times out of 11, uh, there's this mention, uh, oh, sorry, every time it is mentioned, we have this expression. In Leviticus 11.45, it simply says, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. To be your God, therefore, be holy because I am holy. Verse 55, for the Israelites belong to me as servants. They are my servants whom I brought out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Verse 38, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. And in verse 45 it says, But for their sake I will remember the covenant with their ancestors whom I have brought out of Egypt in the sight of the nations to be their God. I am the Lord. Just one common expression all the way through. He wanted Israel to be holy, just as he is holy. He wanted to give them Canaan, the promised land, as he had promised. He wanted them to serve him because Israel belongs to him. He wanted to keep his promise that he had made with all their ancestors. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Over and over again, God mentions this. There are these constant reminders. I am the Lord. What did I do? I brought you up out of Egypt. Notice, not only out, but up out of Egypt from being down in slavery into a new life and a new land. To over 600,000 people, God was constantly reminding him, them of, his enorm of this enormous victory over the Egyptians on their behalf. And from the time the plagues fell upon Egypt until they the Hebrews rested on the opposite side of the Red Sea and saw the bodies of the Egyptian soldiers washed up on the shoreline, they constantly saw God's hand leading in every aspect for their freedom. 
miracle after miracle after miracle, and yet, and yet. They are now on the border to the promised land. The spies have returned with their report, and yet they are still moaning and groaning. We pick up the story actually in the book of Numbers, chapter 14. So if you'd like to, to turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 14, and I'm reading from verse 1, and I've just taken this quote from the book of the NIV version again. It says, That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Can you imagine that? Here's Aaron and Moses falling prostrate before the, the whole assembly, the, the 600,000 people probably. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Japhneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes. In utter frustration after exploring the land and hearing the bad reports of the other spies, they were besides themselves and they tore them clothes and they said, said to the entire Israel assembly, the land we passed through and, and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. So what he's basically underlining here is he's confirming the Lord has led them to now and he's going to lead them into the promised land. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then all of a sudden the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting of all the Israelites. That scene all the way through the glory of the Lord leading, and then suddenly it is there again. The same glory in God whom had freed them and worked on their behalf, the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? Can you even begin to imagine the frustration of our Lord? He goes on to say, I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but it will make you into a greater and stronger, stronger nation than they. Moses said to the Lord, but hang on, then the Egyptians will hear about it. By you power, your power, you brought these people out from among them and they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people and that you, Lord, have seen they have seen you face to face. That your cloud stays over them and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put these people to death all at one time, the nations who have heard this report about you will say, the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land he promised them on oath, so he slaughtered them in the wilderness. Now, Moses pleads again with the Lord. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, says Moses, forgive the sins of these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. Verse 20 goes on to say, And the Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one has treated me with contempt. Sorry, no one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. 
But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to. And his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and the Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. The Lord says to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the sentence, census and who, has, and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. As for your children that you said should, would be taken as plunder, I will bring them into the, in to enjoy the land you have rejected. But you, your bodies will fall in the wilderness. Your children will be the shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness, until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days, you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will surely do these things to the whole wicked community which is banded together against me. They will meet the end in this wilderness, they are here they will die. So the men Moses had sent to explore the land who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it. These men who were responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. How sad is that? Of the men who went to explore the land, only Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh survived. When Moses reported this to all the Israelites, they mourned bitterly. And this is amazing what they did next. The next day, early in the morning, they set out for the highest point in the hill country, saying, now we are ready to go to the land the Lord has promised. Surely we have sinned, but Moses says, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed. Do not go up, because the Lord is not with you. You will be defeated by your enemies, for the Amalekites and, and Canaanites will face you there. Because you have turned away from the Lord, he will not be with you, and you will fall by the sword. Nevertheless, in their presumption, they went up toward the highest point in the hill country, though neither Moses nor the Ark of the Lord's Covenant moved from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in the hill country came down and attacked them and beat them down all the way to Hormah. How sad a story is that? These people had seen face to face the glory of God. They'd seen the way he'd led them in every aspect of deliverance from Egypt. Brothers and sisters, it is this time for us to listen clearly to what God has to say to us. And as he said to them, he says to us today, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God who has freed you from sin. I gave you my son to pay the price for your freedom from the bondage of sin. We are no longer bound by the penalty or wages of sin. No, we have been freed. As the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? How long are we going to teach, uh, treat the Lord with contempt? How long... Are we going to do things our way instead of his way? The same message is even more valid for us today. We are on the borders of the promised land, and we had that confirmed by a sermon from Basil recently too. The Lord has led us through 2010. He blessed and worked miracles in our lives, and he answered our prayers. You know, And that's the Lord of the universe, the Lord that created this earth has worked miracles in our lives. He has personally come down and answered our prayers. Do not treat the Lord with contempt. Let us complaining, let us stop grumbling, and let us serve the Lord. Let us go and prepare to live in the promised land. 
Let us renew our spirit as, they, as did Caleb and Joshua so that we can glorify our Lord Jesus. Let us not disobey God's word or command, but let Wangare know that we are his church and he has called and raised us up for this time in earth's history. And I would like that to be uh, your prayer of dedication this morning as we go into 2011, that Jesus will be the centre of your lives. Amen.